Yes. Yeah, we I think uh, can start. People will keep on joining as uh, they will come to know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, friends. As uh, you are all aware, and now you have all uh, accustomed to the schedule of having an academic venture of Indian Journal of Medical and Pediatric Oncology and the ISMPO, which is our parent body in India. Every Tuesday evening is for this IJMPO talks. We invite an expert in medical oncology from anywhere in the and we request them to share their wisdom with us about any particular field of their choice with uh, which they have expertise there is a talk of the expert for first half an hour or so and then we have which is the highlight of this event we have an interaction with the expert i mean the last five more sessions the time for interaction was almost equal or much more than the time for the talk now the way we go is i have muted everybody's microphone my microphone also will be muted after dr goyal babu's talk will start everybody who wants to put in a question will put it in the chat everybody knows by now and one by one once the talk is over then we will i'll read out the question and dr govind babu will answer the question now we are recording this session and eventually we plan to host it on a website for everybody's benefit at a later date now with this introduction and uh, one more very important thing which uh, i want to announce here is we all there are many students uh, in this audience this activity has been started uh, for the uh, benefit of students today we are inviting our uh, stark country audience also uh, as and when uh, this event becomes more and more popular we will be involving so many other people as well but the most important thing is this is the jmpo and isump initiative and all of uh, you uh, must become isump isump members because over a period of time this will be a member restricted event only the members of isumpo will be invited and have access to these uh, events so uh, i would request you all of you to become member of ismp as soon as possible and take advantage of uh, academic initiatives like this now with this introduction uh, i will invite uh, ismp president current ismp president dr govind babu to talk about the liquid biopsy current status with us he may like to talk to us about ismpo if uh, he wants to and then he can go ahead with his talk dr goyal babu uh, thank you padmanch uh, welcome to all the uh, people who have uh, logged in and i think uh, especially these times of the lockdown uh, we thought this will be a good initiative to start and uh, hopefully we will continue this uh, as long as uh, we have people wanting it and i think this is a easy way There's of there is one thing i wanted to add sir yeah let's pick up echo while you are talking oh so you might have to be slightly slow okay and uh, yeah right okay um so uh, this initiative uh, is our societies and we want everybody to benefit from it and so i had asked uh, dr padmaj if we can uh, invite the sac members as well and uh, he has agreed to that so Uh, many of them would uh, have said that they will log in and listen to these talks uh, it is uh, generally aimed to uh, help the dm and dnb students of course anybody else is also welcome to join in and uh, this is going to be a lecture for about 25 30 minutes uh, followed which we'll have interactions 
So we don't want uh, interruptions because then that will uh, break the thoughts and also waste a lot of time. So please mark down all your questions and as Padmat said, you can send it via chat and uh, he will uh, proceed with those questions later on. Um, I think there's a good initiative of our society and as Padmat said, I would request all of you to be become members of the society because uh, uh, you have seen the things that are happening and unless we have a strong body and we stay united, it's very difficult for us to reach anything and achieve anything we want. Uh, so that is my humble request to you. So with that, I think I will start the talk. Uh, Padmesh, can I have the slides? I'll share. You may sick. Yeah. So I'll be talking about uh, liquid biopsy and uh, its status today. And as you all are aware, uh, this liquid biopsy is becoming very, very important today. And uh, we are resorting to its use more and more uh, in, in these days and it will increase in the coming days as well. So I will uh, touch upon the various aspects that, are, uh, that have emerged and how uh, significant this particular topic is. And uh, as the students who are listening, um, most of the times you'll get this as one of the questions, so that is also important. It's not just for the exam, it is good for you to know as well. So I have titled this uh, talk as Liquid Biopsy Today's Status. And in this slide, you can see the hospital where I worked for almost 30 years. And I really am grateful to this place and the patients there because whatever I have achieved today and have learned is from this very place. Next slide, Pradmash. Uh, so when we talk about cancer, we always talk about genes and mutations. So uh, this is important for us to remember because these are what we're going to target for therapy. So we know there are about 140 driver genes, 60% of them are considered as tumor suppressor genes and 40% as dominant oncogenes. Uh, till date, we have identified over 1000 driver mutations and uh, many tumors have two to 10 driver gene mutations. And it's also important to remember that we have something called passenger gene mutations, and uh, this can be in the order of 10 to 100 uh, per tumor. So that's important for us to remember. Next one. So why are we interested in these genes and mutations is because we are talking about personalized cancer therapy. And uh, by uh, molecularly profiling the tumor of your patient, you're able to come to some conclusion as to whether you can have prognostic markers, you can have markers to predict for drug sensitivity or resistance and the emerging concept of trying to predict for adverse events. So these are the important things that constitute uh, the personalized cancer therapy that we're talking about today. Next slide. Next slide, Palmach. Okay. So let's come to this topic of liquid biopsy. So there's several definitions. One of the narrow definitions that uh, came in very early was that it was a blood test that is associated with cytopathological assessment of circulating tumor cells. But uh, today we understand that this could have a broader definition that could include circulating tumor DNA, circulating tumor RNA, and the exosomes as well. And the appeal for liquid biopsy, as I told you earlier, uh, has varied manifestations. It could be for diagnosis, we could talk about prognosis, theranostics, prediction, and also to study the biology of a tumor. So these are the various aspects wherein liquid biopsy could come very useful. So one of the important things that we learned very early on is the angiogenic switch that occurs in tumors. Can you just click? So when tumors grow beyond about 0.5 uh, to 1 millimeter, um, the nutrition that they get from the surrounding capillaries is not enough. And for these tumors to survive and continue to grow, they need to do something called the uh, angiogenesis. And uh, this the tumor does by secreting several factors. And one of the most well characterized is the vascular endothelial growth factor called the VEGF. And this produces angiogenesis. And you must remember that these new blood vessels that are formed are invariably leaky and that actually helps the tumor cells to 
enter the blood circulation and produce metastasis. So this angiogenic switch from a small tumor as it grows big is an important step. So when we're talking about liquid biopsy, let's see how it is in contrast to the targeted tissue biopsy that we're all familiar with. We always talk about Hello? 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 Am I audible? Hello? You, uh, we lost your voice, sir. The, now it is, now I heard you. Oh, really? Okay. okay. So, Hello? we are talking about the tumor heterogeneity and uh, the targeted tissue biopsy is a hindrance to take care of this tumor heterogeneity. Whereby the liquid biopsy seems uh, like a good option because uh, this tumor heterogeneity is taken care of because we believe that the circulating or the uh, tumor DNA that is picked up from the, uh, any of these uh, uh, liquids in the body represents the homogeneity in the tumor. And of course, the accessibility is there. When we talk about liquid biopsy, what comes to our mind first is blood. We can also use the serum, plasma, urine, pleural fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, and any other body fluids that are secreted. And one of the most important thing of the liquid biopsy is that you can look at the temporal heterogeneity and the temporal evolution of the disease because you can have serial access to this circulating tumor DNA. That's how liquid biopsy is different from a targeted tissue biopsy. So I have got uh, this talk in two parts. The first one will be the circulating tumor cells and the next one will be the circulating tumor DNA. Uh, circulating tumor cells, next slide. Uh, the promise of circulating tumor cells has been there for a very, very long time. Uh, you must remember that uh, the work on circulating tumor cells is pretty difficult, tedious, and the results are not always forthcoming. And therefore people have really concentrated more on the circulating tumor DNA rather than circulating tumor cells. But we do have quite a bit of evidence and I will show you some of it. So the promise of circulating tumor cells is for looking at tumor staging. This can be used as real time markers of disease progression and survival. For this, I will show you our own study as an example. This can be used to guide therapy indicate therapy effectiveness, and it could also help us to look at uh, clues for the drug resistance. We can use this as surrogate endpoints. In fact, many trials have had uh, circulating tumor cells as one of the endpoints as well, and treatment targets. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So when we talk about circulating tumor cells, you must remember that in one milliliter of blood, there are about a million WBCs, a billion RBCs and very few circulating tumor cells. So if you're trying to look for the circulating tumor cells, it is like looking for a needle in a haystack. That is the real idiom I can think of when we talk about looking for CTCs in the blood. Next. Next slide. So there have been various techniques that have come in to look at these uh, um, isolating the circulating tumor cells and this table lists a few of these and uh, this was way back in 2014 that all these were uh, described. And this has actually helped us to pick up the circulating tumor cells better. Next. And uh, from being looking at a uh, uh, needle in a haystack, today because of these various techniques that we have, the needle or the CTCs look so big in the haystack. And that is what has helped us because these techniques in the lab have helped us to isolate, characterize, and study the circulating tumor cells. Next. Next slide, Parmesh. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of the studies that have come in. And this is a few studies which I've taken, looking at the prognostic value of CTC count for survival in cancer patients. And initially, as you can always think that this was done in advanced disease. Uh, this is by Dr. Christopher Nelly, who published in NEGM in 2004. And this was his cohort of uh, breast cancer patients. 
and he showed that those people who had more than or less than or more than three CTCs, there was a difference in terms of the progression free survival. Next. So this was uh, by Dr. Cohen in colorectal cancer. He also showed a similar thing that those people who had a uh, higher number of CTCs in the peripheral blood were doing poorly. Next one. So again, this paper is from prostate cancer by Deborn, and he showed a very similar thing in, a, uh, in about 2008 period. So we do have evidence to show that uh, the number of circulating tumor cells can actually um, look and predict for survival in these patients. Next slide. So what I'm going to show next is a meta-analysis of about 49 studies in breast cancer patients, which uh, comprises of uh, almost 7,000 patients. And the first part is to look at progression-free survival. So this showed that those people who had a more number of CTCs, and for each tumor, they've taken different numbers as cutoff for breast, it's usually three to five. And they found that the progression-free survival correlated very well with the presence or absence of circulating tumor cells in these patients. Next. So not just progression-free survival, but overall survival as well. And you can see from these two graphs, this was published in 2012. But we are... Hello? Hello? You lost your voice, sir. Hello? 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 Can't hear you, sir. Hello? Are you there? Hello? 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 Not what? Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello. Ah, I can hear you now. I think there's some problem with the audio connection, I suppose. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now, can you hear now, me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, okay, okay. So, we were talking about... Uh, we were talking about overall survival. Yeah, that's right. So, this is the meta-analysis showing you this uh, evidence of CTCs in uh, breast cancer patients. Next slide. Okay, so uh, it is not just the number of CTCs uh, people have been looking at, they've actually tried to look at genomic characterization of single CTCs. Uh, in fact, we are also trying to work on this. So people have picked up single CTCs, looked at mutation analysis, CGH, and also have the next generation sequencing. And uh, they believe that this, in fact, is the way forward for studying CTCs. Next slide. Next slide, Padmash. Yeah. So uh, I thought I'll just sh share with you the study that we did, uh, looking precisely at what I've shown you earlier, that using CTCs as predictors of response. And this was a collaborative work uh, between Kidwai and two other basic science inst institutes in Bangalore. Next slide. Next, Padmash. So I would like to acknowledge uh, these people who have worked, including my uh, DM people. And uh, this essentially shows you the workflow that we collected peripheral blood from metastatic disease. We had two cohorts, one of breast and one of lung, and we isolated the CTCs and cultured them. And after culturing them, we serially followed them, followed these patients for uh, response uh, assessment and uh, looking at resistance. That was the first part. 
this slide actually shows you what we are doing further. We are trying to look at uh, drug testing on these peripheral blood clusters of uh, CTCs, and we are trying to establish a CDX model um, and also look at uh, growing these tumors and doing drug testing on them. Next slide. Okay, so this is uh, how the culture was done. This was done on uh, uh, micro wells in agar plates and we stained them with uh, CD45 and cytokeratin to make sure that these were the cell, uh, tumor cells uh, which were present there. And we cultured them and studied the characteristics in form of whether they were forming clusters or not um, at day eight and day 15. So we hypothesized that uh, those patients who are not going to do well will have tight clustering of the circulating tumor cells. And the hypothesis has been that uh, these will have more adhesion molecules and therefore the clusters will be tight. So there is a, uh, something called a gray scale which has been used to classify these uh, CTC clusters into loose, tight and very tight clusters. Next slide. Okay, so this is how the CTCs were uh, identified based on cytokeratin, which is the epithelial marker and CD45 which is the leukocyte common antigen. Next slide. So I will show you some of the examples of individual patients. Uh, if you look on the top of the slide, you will see a bar which is gray and it also has a red portion. The red portion represents the percentage of tight clusters and the gray portion represents loose clusters. So this is a triple negative uh, patient of metastatic breast who was started on gemcitabine and carboplatin and uh, she's been, she was responding well. So if you look at... Hello? ...of treatment when we actually assessed her, we found that uh, the number of tight clusters was still very small. And we showed that she was continuing to respond to treatment. So this actually uh, is a way of trying to assess response and correlate with the regular uh, assessments that we do for our patients. Next slide. Next. Yeah. So this uh, is a patient who actually progressed on the treatment. And as you can see, the part of the red in the bar has increased at 12 weeks. And uh, this patient was not responding. In fact, she was progressing as uh, evidenced by the PET scans that are there in the lower part of the slide. And this again showed us that uh, we could use the CTC clustering to tell us, and uh, we found a positive correlation of response to treatment. Next slide. So what I showed you uh, were the breast cancer patients and this uh, few slides I will show you is examples of non-small cell lung cancer. So this was a patient who had an EGFR mutation and he was started on gefitinib. And if you see the orange part of the bar, you can see that at 12 weeks, it had dramatically increased. And that correlated with the imaging assessment which showed that there was indeed progression. So we had to resort, this was a time when we were uh, not really doing the T790M and all that. So we had to resort to chemotherapy for this patient. And as you can see, after four cycles of chemotherapy, the assessment showed that he was responding and the uh, orange part of this bar has also decreased. Next slide. So this is uh, another patient who actually had resistance to gefitinib. And as you can see here, at the end of eighth week itself, the number of uh, the percentage of the orange on the bar has increased. So we did uh, show that uh, uh, this can be a good way of looking at correlation uh, with the response assessment. And th we could use this as an indicator for changing therapy as well. Next slide. So this is actually showing you the survival curves. We had two cohorts. We had about 50 patients of lung and 50 patients of breast. And uh, this is the survival curves, although the cohorts are small, but this, uh, um, this sort of tells us that in fact, this uh, CTC clustering can be used uh, in fact, uh, and correlated with survival as well. Uh, so we know that the cluster formation, if it is tight, it correlates with shorter overall survival. Next slide. 
So like I said, this was a collaborative work between two basic science uh, institutions and uh, our own hospital. And uh, fortunately, last year, we were able to publish this uh, in the scientific reports. So this is just for you to see. Next slide. I think I like to uh, yeah, uh, so move on to the next presentation. Yeah, I will just continue to talk. Uh, so what I've shown you so far is the uh, circulating tumor cells. In fact, I've uh, shared uh, this pr presentation in two parts because uh, it was pretty heavy. So that's why Padma is taking some time to put on the second one. So the second one is, uh, second part is going to be on circulating tumor DNA. So as I've shown you, the circulating tumor cells is becoming uh, an important uh, aspect. And although I've shown you our uh, data, which was published with breast and uh, um, uh, the head, uh, lung cancer, we are now working on head and neck cancers and colon cancers as well, including urological cancers. So we will have some data on Hello? 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 Hello. I lost your voice, sir. Hello. 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 Am I audible? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello? Yeah, now I can hear you, voice, sir. Yes, case lost in between. Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay, fine. So let's go on to the second part, which is the circulating tumor DNA. Next slide. So the, let's look at a little bit of the history of circulating DNA because we always must remember the history for us to move forward. So in 1977... Uh, Hello. Lost your voice again. Now? Yeah, now yes. Okay. In 1991, P53 mutation was uh, found from the blood, urine of bladder cancer patients. And KRAS mutation was identified in plasma of colorectal cancer patients. And the era of CTDNA got important because of the specific... Again, gone, sir. Now? Yes, now we are. Okay. So the era of CTDNA in 2003, the beaming technique came. Then in 2008, we had the shotgun sequencing of cell-free DNA. In 2011, it was safe sequencing for digital sequencing of small amplicon uh, panels. And in 2013 was the big leap, which was the full exome sequencing. And uh, this was done from the cell-free DNA. Next slide. Okay, a little bit of terminology because people have uh, interchangeably used uh, circulating tumor DNA, cell-free DNA or free cell DNA. 
But for our purposes, since we are dealing with tumors, I think ctDNA or circulating tumor DNA seems the most appropriate. And we must remember that this cell-free DNA is pretty abundant in peripheral blood, uh, almost 25 nanograms per ml. And uh, it's been estimated that for a patient with a tumor that weighs 100 grams, uh, up to 3.3% of this tumor DNA may enter blood each day. So that is a big potential for us to harness, harvest, and study the characteristics of the tumor. And uh, DNA from the apoptotic cells is in the size of 185 to 200 base pairs, which is nucleosome protected. And indeed, long DNA fragments may be suggestive of malignancy. So as compared to the normal DNA, normal cell DNA fragments, the tumor cell DNA fragments are much larger, and this could be one of the ways of identifying the circulating tumor DNA. Next slide. Okay, so there's always been a tug, sort of a tug of war uh, between people who have been working on CTCs and cell-free DNA, but we must remember that each one complements the other and they need to go hand in hand and it's not that uh, there should be a tug of war between these two groups. Next slide. Uh, you know, when we talk about uh, liquid biopsy, lung cancer has been the poster boy for liquid biopsy. So most of the data that I'm going to show essentially is from non-small cell lung cancer. Of course, the uh, data is emerging in other tumors as well. So this is a slide uh, to show you that this is from the Lung Cancer Mutation, Mutation Consortium. And this actually shows you that the overall survival by mutation and treatment is in fact beneficial. So the pink uh, curve is for those patients who had a driver mutation and were specifically treated with targeted therapy. Whereas the blue and green ones, the blue one is those patients who had driver mutations but did not receive targeted therapy. And the green one is for those patients who had no driver mutations. So if a patient has a driver mutation and gets a targeted therapy, then he's going to do much better than patients who do not have a driver mutation or those who have a driver mutation, but are not given the targeted therapy. So this is an important slide for us to remember because there's no point in just identifying a target. You must act upon it to benefit the patient. Next slide. Next, Padma. I'm sure you recognize this person, she's Mona Lisa. So if you actually zoom in, you will see that it's a collage of several other pictures and uh, non-small cell lung cancer from when I started practice in the last century, it was just that small Mona Lisa in the left. Today, this is how non-small cell lung cancer is, that it's a collage of several diseases put together and we call all of them non-small cell lung cancers. I'm sure you can imagine now we're talking about EGFR mutation, ALK mutation, ROS1, and several other things which are coming up. Next. Next slide. So this is just to talk about evolution of identification of genomic alteration in lung adenocarcinomas. From 1984 to 2003, if you look at this pie, we knew uh, a fourth of this pie had Keras mutation, for which we had no drug till recently and now we do have one drug for a specific KRAS mutation. In 2004, we understood that we have the EGFR mutation. Next slide. Next. And then in 2009, almost half of this pie, we were able to have slices uh, showing that uh, there were several other uh, mutations which could be targeted. Next. And this is uh, in 2015, we have more than half of this pie which have several targets. And for most of these, we have drugs today. So that's how from 1984 till 2015, we have shown a progress. And all this has happened because of the advances in molecular biology techniques, uh, which the lab people have been working on. And uh, we have very rapidly adopted all these techniques and uh, we have had designer drugs to target each one of these mutations. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So this is just talking about EGFR uh, testing. I'm sure all of you remember. Expression by immunohistochemistry. Then people looked at uh, EGFR gene copy uh, with the uh, fish and then came in the actual mutation analysis. 
So when we are talking of EGFR mutation, uh, this is a slide we must keep in mind that uh, this Hello. Your voice lost. Sir. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is uh, on chromosome 7P12, and we're interested in exons 18 to 24. And as this shows, exon 18, 19, 20, and 21, it's important for us to know each one of these mutations because some of them are uh, uh, sensitive to the TKIs that we use, and some confer resistance. So it's important for us to know the specific mutation in these patients. Next slide. Hello? Yeah. Yes, just a second. <laughs> no problem, no problem, no. Uh, just some technical snag. No problem, no problem. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is what I was talking about, the AGFR mutation. Now, uh, there were two important studies actually. Uh, before this IPASS, we had a study called ISIL, which was one of the initial studies, uh, of the PI of uh, which was Dr. Nick Thatcher. And fortunately, India was also a part of this study, which actually looked at gefitinib in uh, patients who had progressed on a first-line chemotherapy. And that actually showed us uh, important things that uh, although the drug was not approved on that study uh, because uh, there was a lot of uh, confusion about where the patients fitted in and Indians were uh, considered as Caucasians. Uh, although we now know that uh, we have higher EGFR mutation percentage and that study did not look at this percentage and what came out of that study actually was uh, Jeftinib was useful in women, people who are non-smokers of Asian ethnicity. And that was the thing that came out and only from there people went back from the bedside to bench and understood that we need to look at uh, uh, pharmacogenomics and the EGFR story slowly unraveled. So this IPASS is the second study which again looked at jeftinib versus chemotherapy. Next slide. And the PI for this was uh, Dr. Tony Ma. And he showed that uh, um, those patients who had a mutation, in fact, this uh, entry was not with the mutation analysis. This was a, a study that was done much later on. And they showed that uh, in those people who had a mutation in the EGFR, they were doing better with jeftinib, whereas those patients who did not were doing worse with jeftinib as compared to chemotherapy. Next slide. So EGFR mutation positive, you can see the green curve, which is for those patients who received jeftinib and the blue curve for those patients who got chemotherapy, you can see that uh, the mutation patients received jeftinib are doing better. Next. And this is actually going to show you that uh, patients who, who had no mutation were doing worse on jeftinib and doing better on chemotherapy. So it's important for us to look at the mutation that is there and use the proper Hello. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yeah, I can yeah. hear you now. Okay. So why I'm showing you these studies is because uh, many of these studies had liquid biopsy as a part of their study. Next. And uh, this uh, showed us that in fact that was useful. So this is a slide to look at jeftinib, erlotinib, and afetinib um, as compared to chemotherapy and uh, definitely shows that all those patients who had a mutation are responding better to the TKIs. Uh, this is the first line and second line TKIs that we've used and uh, their PFS's response rates and PFS is definitely better than with chemotherapy. Next slide. But soon we came to understand that uh, most of these patients are progressing and uh, for all these, we never had an overall survival advantage till now. And their median time to progression was about 8 to 14 months. So people started looking at why these people were progressing. Next slide. And this uh, initial cohort of patients who were studied, they had a biopsy. 
a repeat biopsy done and we know the problems of repeat biopsy um, many times uh, it's in a place the tumor is in a place where the accessibility is not possible um, or uh, several other factors patient is not uh, accepting so this repeat biopsy the initial cohort that was done was on 37 patients precisely and uh, it showed that almost 49% of these patients had this specific T790M mutation as a resistance mechanism. Of course, you also need to remember that there was a histology change in 14%. So it is imperative that you always keep that in the back of your mind because a non-small cell lung cancer can turn into a small cell lung cancer when your treatment strategies are definitely going to change. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So uh, the rationale for uh, plasma-based or cell-free DNA testing is, I've already told you before, it is very similar basis as for the circulating tumor cells, that you can pick up all these uh, uh, mutations from the peripheral blood itself. Next slide. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me now? This had a Hello. high, yeah, this had a high number of patients. Hello? Yes. yes. Yeah. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. So this study actually showed that yes, the T790M mutation was in fact much higher to the extent of 63%. Next slide. Plus there were other mutations as well. Next. So uh, what does this mutation do? This is a substitution of methionine for threonine at position 790. And this, what it does is decreases the drug binding through steric hindrance and increased binding affinity with ATP, which is at the expense of the TKI binding. So uh, this is actually competing with the first and second generation TKIs that we use and producing resistance. Next slide. Next slide. So understanding uh, this particular thing, a uh, drug was actually designed. So this is one of the first designer drugs to have come in. And this is uh, showing you the similar thing. And uh, this drug uh, actually now is what is called. Next slide. Next slide, Parman. Yeah. So this was uh, one of the first uh, part of the phase one studies. And this drug, uh, osimatinib, what we know today, was called AZD9291. And as you can see, this initial cohort uh, of uh, 35 patients. Hello? Yeah. We lost your voice, sir. Hello? 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 Hello, sir? Hello? Not yet. No worries yet. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Uh, so as I was uh, telling you this, uh, that this was the first uh, phase one study of uh, AZ, uh, which uh, drug which we today know as Osimertin. Next slide. Uh, so we're talking about, uh, like I said, this study had uh, an exploratory analysis of looking at liquid biopsy and they looked at plasma or serum as uh, to pick up the material for looking at these mutations. And uh, it clearly became evident that plasma was a better uh, uh, substrate to look at these mutations because that contained a higher number of uh, uh, these mutations because in the, in the serum, there was much more uh, normal genomic DNA than as compared to plasma. 
So this uh, slide is just showing you that in terms of se sensitivity, um, this is from these two studies, Luxlam 3 and Luxlam 6, that uh, the plasma sensitivity was as high as 60% as compared to the serum, which was just close to 30%. So it is plasma that you need to look at for studying these mutations and not serum. Next slide. So uh, it's important that we have adequate uh, DNA, tumor DNA content because uh, the lesser the quantity of DNA, the, the sensitivity of the test need to be higher. So there is a limit to mutation detection and therefore uh, we need to have basic amount of DNA to get the results properly. Otherwise, you may not be able to pick up a mutation that is always there just because your test was not sensitive enough because the DNA content was not good enough for you to study and pick up this mutation. So that's what this slide shows you. So it's very important that you have a good amount of tissue for your test to be successful. So again, this is uh, from the two studies, again, the I ISIL study and the IFM study, which shows uh, whether you look at the tissue or the plasma and you pick up these mutations, the response to therapy in terms of PFS or the objective response are very, very similar. So you can confidently use liquid biopsy uh, as compared to the tissue biopsy to plan your therapy by looking at the mutation analysis. Next slide. So this is a more detail. Hello. 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 Not yet. Hello. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, something wrong with the line. <laughs> Sorry. So this is again I just so, yeah. uh, showing you the, uh, these two studies, the IPAS and IFM studies which had this liquid biopsy as a part of their study, uh, showing you that you can confidently use the data that comes out from this liquid biopsy as compared to the tissue biopsy and uh, use them for the therapeutic benefit for your patient. Next slide. Uh, so this is uh, to show you when you detect a T790M mutation and you treat these patients with uh, drug like osimertinib, whether the t 790 mutation was picked up on the tissue biopsy or on the liquid biopsy, this waterfall plot shows you that uh, they're very, very similar. In fact, they can be superimposed on one another. Again, giving you the confidence as a clinician that you can definitely use the data that or information that comes out of the liquid biopsy as strongly as that you had it from the tissue biopsy. Next slide. Uh, so, actually what we are today doing is when a patient progresses on a TPI, we first do a, a liquid biopsy because that is a least invasive and uh, it, because we know most of them, the progression is with T790 mutation, but in 30% of these patients, it may not be picked up on the tissue, uh, on the liquid biopsy. So, if the liquid biopsy is negative, then you make all attempts to try and get the tissue to look at other mutations or t 790 m mutation. Now, uh, I told you that you can serially follow up your patient with liquid biopsy. And this is one of the papers published in 2016, showing you that uh, the clinical utility of cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA in detecting t 790 m mutation and guiding your patients for the TKI therapies. And what this uh, study actually showed was that the uh, circulating tumor DNA was detected almost two months prior to clinical progression of the disease. 
uh, again, we can argue that uh, this is like a lead time bias, you know, very similar to CA125 in uh, uh, ovarian cancers where we do not act upon it. But here we know that uh, T790M mutation is a driver mutation and probably this can help us in instituting this uh, change therapy much earlier. And this specific TKI and they serially followed up for the amount of T790M DNA, they found that as the patients were uh, responding, the levels were decreasing. Next slide. Okay, so this is just to show you the differences in the three generations of TKIs we have. Relative IC50 concentration of these drugs varies. And for jeftinib and erlotinib or rifatinib to target T790M mutation, you need to give it in very high concentrations, which clinically may not be possible. And that's why we are using osimertinib. Next slide. So uh, this is just a bit of our own data. In fact, we uh, tied up with MedGenome in Bangalore to do this. Uh, we looked at CTDNA in uh, two cohorts of patients, colorectal and non-small cell. Majority, almost 84% of them were non-small cell lung cancer patients. Next slide. So I will show you data on our initial 60 patient cohort of this, 45 were adenocarcinomas and 15 were squamous cell carcinomas. And uh, in fact, I will concentrate a little on the squamous cell because uh, uh, four of these patients of the 15 showed EGFR mutation, which, could, which was potentially targetable. And uh, two of these patients had come to us with just FNAC saying that this was lung Since this uh, study was going on, we used the liquid biopsy to look at the mutation. And uh, we found that four of them had EGFR mutation. And we treated these with uh, TKIs. And two of them did show response. Again, telling us that uh, even in squamous cell carcinomas, it's important that we look for driver mutations. Next slide. Uh, so uh, this paper, in fact, we have published in 2019 in the uh, South Asian Journal of Cancer. So if people are interested, they can go and look this up. Next slide. Uh, so this is an interesting study which uh, was done because it had a lot of exploratory analysis uh, tied into it. This was a tiger egg study which looked at uh, this drug called rosalitinib which because of its toxicity did not come into the market. But what is interesting is that uh, Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. And they used the tissue as a reference for the mutation. And uh, they also looked at urine for EGFR mutation. And 72%, uh, that is 34 of these 47 specimens for T790M and 75% for L858R and 67% uh, for exon 19 deletion. And they found that there was a very good correlation of these mutations in the urine. So they also did with plasma and found a very good correlation. So although this uh, study or this drug was, uh, uh, in a sense, the study was negative, but for me, the interesting thing was that uh, this proof of concept of looking for the mutations in plasma and urine uh, was in fact shown that it can be done. So that is the interesting part I would like to take from this study called Tiger X. Next slide. So this is the other important study I thought I should uh, share with you. This is genomic testing of non-small cell lung cancer using circulating tumor DNA. And as I told you, the intra and intertumor variability is present in patient. And therefore, looking at one piece of single tumor can be misleading. So this is the statement made by uh, Dr. Carpenter. And he said that if you take just this bit, uh, bit of tissue, you may be missing the larger picture. Next slide. Next, Padmanj. 
So this uh, had 102 cancer patients between Feb 2015 and March 2016, and they had 112 ctDNA tumor samples in this. And uh, tumor tissue biopsies, they were able to have successfully only for 50 patients. So you can see that uh, getting a tumor tissue is in fact difficult in many places. And 52 of the ctDNA were the only means by which useful genetic data was obtained. So it is almost 50%. Next slide. So what came out from the study was cell-free DNA was got from 86 of 102 patients. 26 of these had EGFR mutation and 32 were started on a TKI. 10 had T790A mutation. Eight of the 10 had no DNA from biopsy. So even if there was a biopsy, there was no DNA. Two had ALK mutations and 56 patients had potential off-label drugs. So this is important to remember because you can pick up, pick up mutations, you can look at the uh, drug libraries and actually repurpose the drugs that are already there. Next slide. Next bit. So the other important thing that came out was the absolute quantity of the cell-free DNA could be a marker for survival. And from this study, of course, it's a, just about 102 patients, but they found that those patients who had a cell-free DNA of more than three nanograms per microliter had a median survival of 24 months. But those who had less than three nanograms, uh, their survival was 46 months. So again, showing you that a simple blood test, quantifying the cell-free DNA can help us to actually talk about survival in these patients. Next slide. Next, Padmaj. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this slide several times. This is to just show you from 1970, treating uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer was just with best supportive care. And today we have so many drugs that have come in. We are talking of survival in terms of well over two years. So this is the importance um, and the progress. Hello. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes. Yeah. So yes. this is a slide which actually shows about if you select your patients properly, then your treatment outcomes are better. So early 70s and 80s, we had no selection. All these patients got platinum-based chemotherapy versus best supportive care. Then coming along, we had clinical selection. We looked at uh, histology, we looked at non-smokers, and uh, we made uh, choices of the specific therapy for these patients, and that was successful. Then in 2009, came in what we spoke about as molecular selection, and uh, with the TKIs coming in, we're having uh, survival in excess of two years. Next. But today, with more and more techniques coming in, more and more things that we are looking at mutations. In 2020, we're having patients with metastatic lung cancer surviving well beyond five years, uh, which was unthinkable a few decades ago. So that is how we have made uh, changes in uh, treating our patients and showing good responses. And to a large extent, the liquid biopsy, which I spoke about till now, has actually come into the mainstream of managing your patients. Next slide. Next slide, Panmaj. So I think with that, I should come to the conclusion to tell you that uh, CTCs and CTDNA exosomes are synergistic substances for wide and complementary array of potential clinical applications. Uh, for example, tumor genotyping, looking for the mutations, a list of them are here. Identifying monitoring acquired resistance. I told you about T790M mutation and the change in histology. Surrogates of drug response, I showed you our study as well. Detecting early relapse, I've shown you evidence for that as well. And picking up novel therapeutic targets, for example, met amplification. And one of the things is whether it could come into early detection, like looking at miRNA in smokers and non-smokers and trying to see if we can pick them up early. So with that, I think I will stop and thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'm sure I can take them. Thanks so much. Do we have any questions? Yeah. yeah, let me stop the screen share. Sure. Yes. Uh, I think we 
have two questions and then the questions will start pouring in. I hope so. Stop screen sharing. Yes. The first question is, sir, your view on use of CTC for diagnosis of cancer, especially in patients with difficult biopsies or cases with repeated negative biopsy with high suspicion on of underlying malignancy. For example, pancreatic lesion with negative biopsies. There are labs propagating such tests. Yeah. Uh, so this is not to be used in routine clinical practice. And uh, this is still in a clinical trial setting. It's not come for routine clinical use. But uh, the data that is coming out is quite promising. But if some labs are actually telling that uh, they're doing it, I would really take it with a pinch of salt. Not a pinch of salt, maybe a kilo of salt. So as of now, we should not be relying too much on these data because one is the validity of the process itself. It is not really standardized as on time, at this time, point of time. And this is still a research thing that is going on. So we should not use it as of now. All right. The, this question was by Atul uh, Narayankar. Yeah. Now the next question is by Avenil Mittal. Uh, in patients with isolated leptomeningeal progression on jefferine, yeah. which sample will be recommended for T790 m mutation, CSA for plasma? Uh, Any data for detecting T790 m yeah. in CSA or other body fluids like pleural fluid? Yeah, there is data for that also. In fact, uh, CSF is also a good substrate. In fact, I still remember we had a patient who came with leptomeningeal disease and we did this isolated leptomeningeal disease and we did a CSF study for this patient and that uh, showed a ROS1 mutation. So you can use that. In fact, there is data on uh, uh, cell-free DNA from perifluid blood in brain tumors. So they've been able to pick up uh, circulating tumor cells and CT DNA from the peripheral blood in brain tumors as well. Uh, but again, these are all. Hello. Hello. We lost your voice, sir. Now? Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, now, yes. Yeah. So uh, you uh, you would uh, you you would say that uh, CSF could be used or any other body fluid could yes. be used yes. for detection. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. The next question is uh, by uh, Gunjan Srivastava. Yeah. Sir, any role of uh, this technique in detecting neuroendocrine transformation in carcinoma prostate? Uh, as of now, there is no data. No. No. Okay. The next question is uh, Dilip Valathol. What is the volume of blood or any other sample required for identification of uh, CF DNA? Does it vary with each sample? Uh, 10 ml should be enough as of now. People are doing it with 5 ml also. You know, like I said, it depends on the quantity of the DNA that is there. So, like uh, a pathologist say tissue not sufficient Yes, and a bigger tissue. So uh, it again depends on the content of DNA, but uh, I think 10 ml should be sufficient. Uh, if your technique is uh, very sensitive, even with 5 ml of blood, you can uh, pick up uh, the cell free DNA. Right. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I will ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, if uh, any one of the audience has got a question, please. Uh, Feel free to uh, put it in the chat. The question is, uh, you, what is the current status? Uh, if, if we have a patient, uh, you, you mentioned we can uh, follow the patient, we can try to diagnose the relapse early, or uh, we can uh, test uh, for uh, recurrence also. So uh, what is the current status for uh, patients uh, post adjuvant therapy for diagnosis of early recurrence say, or post curative surgery for diagnosis of uh, early recurrence and what is the current status uh, post metastatic disease treatment uh, diagnosing early recurrence. Is there any recommendation or what is the status? Uh, 
so there are two parts. One is patient who has had adjuvant therapy and then you're following up for early recurrence. So there is some data with cell-free DNA and CTCs. But again, this has not come into routine guidelines. So as of now, this is still a research tool. In metastatic disease, uh, as I showed you, the T790, the quantity as such uh, is important, but there are very few labs are actually quantifying this. So that uh, uh, brings us to a problem. So there are not enough labs who are doing this as well. But it's an exciting hypothesis that is there. And, uh, you know, when we started doing, looking for mutations uh, with EGFR, it was just EGFR mutation present or not present. That's how the reports used to be. Now we're getting much more uh, significant reports with talking about specific mutations that are there. So I think uh, as we progress with better uh, lab facilities that are there, we will uh, get all this information. All right. The next question is by Gunjan Srivastav. In prescribing tests in clinical practice, how to choose between CTC versus CFDNA? And is a therapy break required for testing? Um, so in CTC, like I said, there are very few people who are doing CTCs. Um, so if you're looking at CTC, you, it, it depends what you're looking at. For uh, say non-small cell lung cancers, since you're looking at TK as a treatment option, uh, the circulating tumor DNA is good enough. You don't need the CTCs for this. CTCs, as I told you, has its own problems because of the methodology, the complexity that is involved. So we have not reached the level of expertise that we have reached in uh, circulating tumor DNA as on date. And uh, therefore, most people are uh, looking at all these mutations in non-small cell lung cancer on the circulating tumor DNA. And uh, what about the therapy break? If somebody is on treatment, yeah. they already started on jefitinib or chemotherapy. What yeah. would be the minimum time duration uh, after so, which you can do? Like, or you can do any time? Yeah, you can do any time. Like I showed uh, you the data from our study, we were doing it, uh, we were doing the CTCs at the point of time when we were having the routine uh, imaging assessments being done. So we tried to correlate with the imaging. Hello. 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 The voice is lost, sir. Hello. Yes, Padmaj. I can hear you. Yeah, now, now you got I it back. Yeah. yeah, now I got it. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the uh, problem so is. There is no break required. Yes, yeah. No, no, no break. Okay, fine. Yeah, the next question is sir, for what all you can use liquid biopsy as of now? Uh, like I said, the poster boy for liquid biopsy is non small cell lung cancer. But uh, there is data coming out for breast, colon. Um, in fact, many uh, uro-oncology uh, cancers as well. And there is some data in brain tumors also. So I showed you our data on lung and breast cancer. Now, as I mentioned, we are working on head and neck cancers and urologic cancers. So maybe in the next six to eight months, we have some more data on these two tumors. But as of now, uh, we would be using uh, only in lung and breast. Is that right? Absolutely. Even breast, uh, it's only for looking at probably the PI3CK mutations. Okay. Right. Yeah. The, the next question is, sir, uh, CLN after adjuvant treatment, swelling in lung, yeah. uh, not suitable surgery. Yeah. Is there still role of CTDNA testing in blood if initial block is EGFR negative? What is the best test to do in such situation if radiation is being planned for treatment? So this is uh, uh, not metastatic disease. So I don't see any role of uh, using TKIs. Yeah, failing in the brain. So it's uh, okay. brain metastasis. Okay, okay. This year lung after adjuvant treatment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a brain metastasis, which is not okay. suitable for surgery. Okay. 
So you can use uh, peripheral blood or even CSF. Both can be used. Right. Uh, can blood transmission affect the result of CT DNA? No. It won't. No. Any indication for CT DNA in clinical practice other than uh, in T790 detection? Yeah, you can detect uh, many other mutations like I showed CMAT, PI3C kinase, HER2. So all these are emerging. Right. The next question is from <laughs> Nilip Lathul. Are there cancers where CFDNA might not be very useful too, like those in tumors with low mutation burden. Of course, it will not be useful because what the tumor throws out is what you can pick up and study. So if the tumor is not shedding enough uh, DNA, then you will not study anything in the peripheral blood. But right. again, there is data uh, uh, look yeah. at this uh, cell-free DNA post-adjuvant. And they believe that... Uh, people who have higher level of DNA or CTC post adjuvant treatment are the ones who will do worse. But again, this is not for uh, routine clinical use as on day. Right. The next question is by further Abzal. Yeah. Uh, since one of the slides mentioned theranostics as one of the applications, what is the status of liquid biopsy guided drug release system? Uh, this is one of the um, regions where work is going on. Again, not for routine clinical use. Definitely not yet. Okay. The next is sorry, in metastatic NSLC patients who have both EGFR and ALK mutations. Yeah. What is the management? Any role of liquid biopsy in these patients? Correct. So, in fact, we have published uh, a paper of four patients who had both EGFR and ALK mutation. And this has been a discussion at various lung cancer meetings. And uh, right now the consensus is <coughs> that you can try either of them first as single agents or you are even justified in using combination. Right. Yeah. The, the next question I, I want to ask you is yeah. the patient is on, uh, he has got a uh, sensitive mutation, EGFR mutation, yeah. he is on uh, uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, now there is some uh, clinical uh, progression. Uh, yeah. You do uh, the EGFR mutation studies, which shows a mixture of sensitive mutation and T790M mutation. T790M mutation is present in a very small number of cells, while the percentage of sensitive mutation is uh, significantly larger. Yeah. So in this situation, what, what should you do? Yes, this has been a question at many meetings again. So they say that if you find T790 mutation, that means that is going to increase over a period of time. If you picked it up now, you change your therapy to something that targets the T790 mutation. All right. Any... Any other question from anybody? I think we pro we probably have uh, this one more question which has come up. Okay. Uh, Atul Narayankar has asked, can this test be used in solid malignancies to detect MSI status? As not pembrolizumab is considered one of the drugs to be used in malignancy which is MSI high. Yeah, there is, uh, there is some work from a lab in California looking at PDL1 on the circulating tumor cells. Okay, but uh, again, it is Correct. not well validated. So, as of now, I don't think uh, we should uh, use that. At least, most of the labs in India, uh, as I know, have no ability to test for this on circulating tumor cells. So, if somebody is telling you right now, you need to actually look at the methodology. So, I will not be comfortable using. Uh, this test for looking at PDL1 on circulating tumor cells as on date. Right. So I think to uh, summarize, uh, this liquid biopsy testing is a very promising technology which has a bright future and is likely to help us in uh, deciding the management, prognosis, and probably therapy 
but as of now i think it's uh, proven role is in ca lung probably in breast and then as a research tool in many other cancers that's right absolutely you summarize it very well yeah thank you very much sir for your time it's been wonderful to have you with us uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much thank you bye bye thanks everybody